Let's get started with that. We want to talk about, in our first part, we want to talk about the office of the deacon. The New Testament talks about that there are two offices in the local church. Of course, Christ is the head of the church. Then there's the office of the pastor, pastor, elder, or overseer. All three of those words are used of the office of, we call it, we, we simply use elder. I suppose that's because, or we simply use pastor because elder and overseer, I don't know, maybe has some connotations to us, but those are used in scripture. The second office that is uh, the New Testament talks about is the office of deacon. This passage that we're going to look at in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is a passage Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus, well-known uh, church. Um, John pastored at Ephesus. Later, uh, Paul started the church at Ephesus. We have a letter from Paul to Ephesus. Here, Timothy is in Ephesus. One of the problems they were having is the kind of people that they were choosing for their leadership. So Paul lays out for Timothy the qualifications that an elder and a deacon needs to have to fulfill that office. Maybe they were choosing the rich people to be, you know, oh, he's well, a lot of money, let's put him in that office. Or maybe the popular people, or maybe the influential people. Paul indicates to Timothy that leadership, both the office of elder and the office of deacon, needs to be fulfilled with spiritual, spiritually mature people. Now, what we're going to read is we're going to go through the qualifications for a deacon. And I know our tendency, because this is the ordination of Alan, everyone's going to be sitting there and thinking, oh, Alan, is, does he fulfill that? Oh, does he fulfill that? Oh, does he fulfill that? But here's, I wonder, I, here's how I want you to think about that. Paul gives these qualifications to Timothy because they need to recognize spiritually mature people who are qualified to fulfill the office of deacon. So these qualifications are not just for deacons. These qualifications ought to be qualities, attributes in our own lives that all of us seek to have in our lives. All right, let's look at them. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. I'll read that. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. Verse 10, they must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Now, here's what I want to do today. I have laid out the qualifications that are listed here, tried to list them. Now, by the way, we're going to be keeping the children up here because we got a bunch of short little segments and we think it will work out well. We won't have our children's church downstairs. We'll, we'll, we'll do all right with that today. I want you to think of the word synonym, not cinnamon, synonym. Okay, we're going to look at these qualities and then rather than me preach to you, and remember we only got a few minutes here, you're going to help me with a synonym for that quality, just to try to break it down a little bit and understand these qualities. Okay, here's one, worthy of respect. Think about that. Paul tells Timothy when you're this local church at Ephesus is choosing a deacon, he needs to be somebody who is worthy of respect. Give me a synonym for that. Ooh, what's that? Unworthy. That's an antonym. That's the opposite. We're talking synonyms, words that same, mean the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of part of it. Um, well, let's, let's just go ahead and define it. Worthy of respect is that when people look at your life, they see, they respect you. That's something that we ought to ought to strive for in spiritual qualifications in our own lives, no matter who we are, whether we're going to be a deacon or not. We ought to be people, what's that? Honest and trustworthy. Honest and trustworthy. Those are some good synonyms for that, huh? All right. 
That's another one. Oh, I, I had those changed around. First of all, the word, I want to tell you about deacon. The word deacon means servant. You have the elder, pastor, overseer, sometimes translated presbytery, you know, that means overseer. Those were for that office. The second office, the office of deacon, where did they get that name from? Well, it comes from the Greek word diakonos, which means servant. We say servant. Another word for it is slave. They had two words in the New Testament for talking about the slaves that the Romans owned. 80% of the Roman Empire were slaves in that day. So a lot of the Christians were slaves to owners. They had two words. One was the word doulos. Doulos was the field slave, lower level slave who worked the fields on the farms and did a lot of the menial work. The diakonos is the other word that was used for a slave, a servant, and that was the household slave. The one maybe who educated the children, the one who was um, the butler. Can I put it that way? Maybe that's not too good of an English synonym, but the household servant. And when they came to the office, the second office that is established in the local church, the deacon was to be a servant, a helper, a helper of the church, a helper of the pastors of that church in fulfilling the ministries of that church. They are to be trustworthy. They are to be sincere. Give me a synonym. Honest. Honest. You know, a lot of people come to church, and the only reason they come to church is maybe they're a businessman, and they try to build relationships to build their business up. You ever talk to people that always seem to have that hidden motive behind what they're talking to you about? Yeah, deacons aren't supposed to be that way. Deacons are to be sincere in anything that they say. Not indulging in much wine. Of course, we know the ravages of alcoholism, how it can ruin a life. Notice it says much wine. Uh, you study the scripture, total abstinence, I don't believe, is necessarily taught in scripture. Paul tells Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Proverbs says wine is dangerous and maybe unwise, but he certainly should not be involved in enslaving things such as alcohol or drugs or other enslaving things. Not pursuing dishonest gain. Not somebody who's always trying to cheat others out of something. It sets a bad reputation for a church when the deacon in that church has, in business or in his life, cheated others. And word gets around the community. Huh? They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. Well, what does that mean? That means they need to understand what the Bible teaches. They need to have an understanding of Bible doctrine. What does it say about Jesus Christ? What does it say about the atonement for our sins? What is the only way to heaven? What uh, the major doctrines of the Bible, a deacon certainly doesn't have to be the level of a trained pastor, but needs to have a good understanding of the doctrines of Scripture. Must be first tested. In other words, shouldn't be just brand new. Oh, this guy got saved two weeks ago. Let's stick him in the office of a deacon. Wait a minute. Let's see what his lifestyle, how he grows. Uh, somebody new comes to the church. Oh, I hear he's really good. Let's put him somewhere. No, let's just wait and see. There's been a lot of churches that have placed people in offices in their local church too soon and found out there's problems. Not a malicious talker. I don't know why, but it just seems that churches are a hotbed for gossip. Huh? Doesn't it seem that way? You know, you get together, oh, did you hear your son, son, blah, 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 blah. A deacon needs to not be involved in that. Temperate and trustworthy. Trustworthy in everything. Trustworthy. Must be trusted. You give them a task, you know they're going to do it. You know they're going to fulfill what they say they are going to do. Husband about one wife. Let me handle these last two. These last two kind of go together. 
Their family is a reflection of their lifestyle. Their family is a reflection of their godliness and spirituality. One of the qualifications are you need to look at their family and see, uh, same thing with a pastor, you need to look at their family and see if they can handle their family well before you put them in an office where they're going to be handling the things of the local church. Now, we look at these not just to think, well, does Alan fill these? Let me tell you, this local church is called a council, a council of godly men, a, a council of ordained men. Um, we sat uh, before Alan, we threw a bunch of tusk, tough questions at Alan, and the council came back with a recommendation that this local church go ahead and ordain him. That council of godly men felt that Alan was qualified. How about your life? I know. Some of you are young, some of you are ladies, some of you maybe aren't looking for the office of deacon. But that does not mean you should not be striving to have these qualifications in your own life because these are qualifications of godliness. I look at my, my clock up here, 20 after, I made it. Rachel? <laughs> I got to see how much time. Oh, we got lots of time, lots of time here. All right, a little background. As you remember, after Solomon, the kingdom split. So you had the southern kingdom of Judah. They followed the, lo the Lord off and on. You had the northern kingdom of Israel. They did not follow the Lord. And um, their capital city was the capital city of Samaria. I know in the New Testament, we got a region that's called Samaria. But in the Old Testament, it was a city and it was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay? They had enemies. One of their enemies was Syria. Now, there's a great big world power a little later called Assyria. That's different than Syria. Syria was attacking them and was winning. In fact, all of Israel and their army and all of the people fled to Samaria and fled inside the city. Now, the cities in those days were built with huge fortified walls on the outside. Uh, that would have been a real problem for the Syrian army to break through Samaria's walls to get the people. They had fled inside the city, they locked the gates, and they were safe for a little while. Well, what they would do in those days when people were locked up in their city walls and you couldn't get at them, they would siege the city. Now, what does that mean? Here's what they would do. They would put a blockade. They would put their army around the city and nobody could get in. And then they would wait. And then they would wait. And then they would wait because all of the people in the city eventually would use up their food and water. Well, Samaria had a source of underground water. We know that. But their food began to get scarce. The previous chapter talks about there was a famine now in the city. Syrian army is camped outside the gates of Samaria. All of the people of Samaria, of, of Israel, are in Samaria and they're eating. You know, <laughs> we got to eat to live, huh? And food is getting short. We hear a little bit later, they, the king says, take some of the horses that are left. Well, what does that imply? Well, they were getting rid of their horses and using them as food. It says in the end of chapter 6 that a donkey's head would sell for, and we won't translate the biblical money value, but for a whole bunch, like $1,000 dollars. Can you imagine going to Myers and going to the meat department and buying a donkey's head for a thousand dollars? You know, it says a piece of, can I say this, of dove dung was like several hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, can you imagine? That's how desperate the people inside the walls of Samaria were because their food was running out. They were killing donkeys. They were killing horses. They were catching what doves they could. Their food resources were gone because Syria was outside the walls, sieging the city. Okay, that's the background. Here's our story. The story is about four lepers. Now, as you know, in those days, lepers couldn't mix with the regular people, so the lepers were at the gate. Okay, so the lepers were starving. They had leprosy. 
They were desperate. So here's what they said. We got three choices. We can either stay here and die. <laughs> Not a very good choice, huh? Or we can go into the city and see if we can find food, but they don't have any food there, and they're all starving, so that's not a very good choice. So our third choice is going out to the Syrians and see if they will have mercy on us. If they kill us, so what? You know, we're going to die here anyway, so let's go out to the Syrians and see if they'll have mercy on us and give us some food. So these four lepers, the Bible is, is clear. It was in the twilight of the day. It was late, late afternoon. Early evening, they're heading out to the Syrian army. Meanwhile, the Lord did an amazing thing. The Lord did a great and tremendous thing. Whether he did it through the wind in the trees or just miraculously, all of a sudden, the Syrian army is sitting there. That's all they had to do, you know, for months on end while they starved the Israelites. All of a sudden, they heard this loud noise. <gasps> and if spirit of fear came over all of them. And they said, uh-oh, the king of Israel has hired the armies of the Hittites and the armies of the Egyptians to come and get us. Now, that really, they hadn't done that. Israel couldn't do that. They were locked up in the city. But this spirit of fear came over them because they heard miraculously there was no army, but the Lord caused them to hear the sounds of a charging army. So the whole Syrian army got so scared that they left. They got up and ran. They left their food, their tents, their horses, their gold even. They left everything and ran for the Jordan River because if they could get over the Jordan River, they'd be somewhat safe. So the whole Syrian army just took off in fear. The Lord did a great thing. Okay, so the four starving lepers come to the edge of camp. Syrians, uh, Syrians, is anyone here? We're some lepers and we want to beg for food. We want to beg for some mercy. Nobody's answering us. And so they went into the camp and they began looking around and there was no... A Syrian army there whatsoever. They were gone. And the four lepers, they look at each other and they said, you know what? There's food. <laughs> the first thing they did was eat. Huh? That was the first thing. They found all kinds of food. And then they started looking around and they looked into tents and there was all kinds of plunder. You know what plunder is? Plunder is when you defeat an army, you get to take all of their stuff. You know, well, these four lepers with the Lord had defeated the Syrian army and the whole camp was left there. Well, they weren't used to that kind of stuff. So the first thing they did is they started hoarding things. Any of you hoarders here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am too. I won't, I won't go into that. But the fir first thing they did was started gathering the stuff, gold and all of the things, food and stuff. And they gathered them up out of one tent and they all went outside the camp and they hid it. They found something great and they went and hid it so they could enjoy it later. Okay. Then they came back in and they went to another tent and they went in there and they gathered all that stuff and they went out and they hid it. Then when they came back for the third tent, all of a sudden one of the lepers, it just kind of came to him. They says, wait a minute. And this is what he said. They said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. Now that's interesting that that is the very word that he used. It was. It was a day of good news. The Syrian army was gone. The siege was over. And the only people who knew about it was not the starving Israelites locked up in Samaria. The only people that knew about it were these four lepers that were in the Syrian camp. Now I say that's interesting because it uses the word good news. Do you know what the word evangelism comes from in the New Testament? The word gospel means 
good news. The EV on the beginning, it's really an EU, which means good. We give somebody a eulogy at a funeral. We say good things about them. That's the Greek word for good, and the second part of it is message. Angelos, we get our word angel from that. Messenger, okay? Good message, good news, evangelism. That's the very word that this leper used. He says, it's not good. We're not doing right. We have all of these great blessings. The Syrians are gone and we got them all more and more than we can even handle. And the people in the city are starving. Uh, This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went back to the city. They decided to spread what? The good news, huh? Yeah. Now, the the gatekeeper, they told the gatekeepers, hey, the Syrian army's gone. There's all kinds of neat stuff. And the gatekeepers went to the king. The king didn't believe it at first, but then the king said, the king says, let's take a couple of the horses we have left. <laughs> that was kind of interesting. He says that, and have some people go check it. So they started riding out. They rode past the Syrian camp and they saw stuff strewn all the way to the River Jordan. So the fleeing Syrian army was still getting rid of their stuff. Although they left almost all of it in camp and what they did take with them, they were stripping off so they could run faster and the Syrian army was gone. Now, I got to tell you another thing that's a part of this story. Elisha had come the day before to that city and Elisha the prophet said, tomorrow at this time, a bushel of fine flour is going to sell for, let's just say, a quarter. And a bushel of barley flour, barley was kind of cheaper than wheat, you know, a bush, two bushels of barley flour are going to sell for a quarter. And that's going to happen tomorrow. Well, there was a captain of the king that was there and heard Elisha. And that captain says, that's not going to happen. If the Lord opened up the gates of heaven and poured down on us, that couldn't happen by tomorrow. And Elisha says, you're going to see it but you're not going to partake of it. Well, here's what happened. When the king got word that this truly was true, that the Syrian army was gone, and there was tons of food in the Syrian camp, the captain, his job was to handle the gates. You know what happened? He couldn't keep the people back. They busted through the gates, thousands of people running out of the city. The king, the the captain who had doubted Elisha, he got trampled and died. He saw the great blessings of the Lord, but didn't partake of them. Why? Because he rejected God's word. Now, there's a lesson in this. God has blessed us. We have been saved. We have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have tremendous blessings from the Lord. And we come every Sunday morning and secretly hide those things here in church and talk about them and rejoice about how great it is. We are not doing right. This is a day of good news. We as a local church need to figure out, need to plan, need to evaluate how we can get the good news of the blessings of the gospel message out to the world in which we live. Alan's going to be a part of that. Future months, we will be getting organized and planning And how we, as those four struggling lepers who have been blessed of God, how we can get that news out to the world. Okay, doing well as well. And then I would like to ask Alan if you will come on down here, if you will. Um, Why don't you come right over here? Uh, Remain standing at this point. Okay. Denise, what happened three weeks ago with the congregation? What did we vote? Three weeks ago, I was thinking. It was two, three weeks ago. We, we voted blank, which 
All right. Alan said before, as I said before, a council uh, of, of godly men who questioned him, and they came back with a recommendation to the church to go ahead and ordain him. Um, then the church voted, and the church ha is accepting Alan and wants to place him in the office uh, of deacon. Many times, the way that is done with by the laying on of hands, and in our situation here, I thought it a little bit impractical for everybody of the local congregation, so I've tried to choose some representatives of the congregation. Alan, right here, and I know, uh, this is something I wouldn't be able to do. Can yep. you get on your knees here? Thank you. <laughs> Dan and Mickey, why don't you come on over here? We are going to, we've already voted as a local church to uh, accept you as our deacon, and I just want to have all three of us uh, have prayer as we lay hands on you as representatives of the congregation and uh, installing you into the office of deacon, ordaining you as a deacon here at Anchor Community Church. Mickey, I wonder if you'll begin, and then Dan, and then myself. Let's lay our hands on him. Let's pray together, people. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for Alan. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your guiding his life and for uh, bringing him uh, here to this point. Lord God, we just uh, we thank you. We uh, uh, acknowledge your work in his life. Yes. And Lord, uh, we look forward to the wonderful things that you have in store for uh, for Alan in your ministry and uh, in service uh, here at Anchor. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have. We thank you for Alan. We thank you that he can be here to do what you want. Lord, bring your spirit upon him, strengthen him, and give him peace of mind. Father, it is your job when somebody receives the Lord Jesus Christ, you instill in them the Holy Spirit, and then you begin to work on their lives and you transform them. You gradually grow them and change them with godly characteristics, things such as the fruit of the Spirit, things that we looked at a little bit earlier in that text in 1 Timothy. And Father, we have recognized that Alan has these characteristics in his life and that he is qualified to be a spiritual leader for the office of deacon here at this local church. And so, Father, we just pray that you um, bless him in this ministry. He is trustworthy and, Father, will fulfill those things that are asked of him. We pray that you will bless this local church as we reach out and begin to bring that good news to those of our community. Thank you, Father. Bless Alan, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Alan. You may rise. Thank you, men. You may be seated. We're going to close in a word of prayer. I'm close. Huh? Yeah. I'm close there. Uh, those who want to stay for uh, our time of, of prayer, Connie's been leading us in that, and that's a, a great thing, I, because I think it's going to take a few minutes downstairs to get some things set, but then we're going to enjoy a time of fellowship, and uh, we get a chance to congratulate and talk to Alan downstairs uh, as well. Uh, we'll have a, time, a potluck downstairs following that. So it'll probably be about 10 minutes or so, Nancy, okay? Uh, and Connie, that will give us time for our prayer time in here as well. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you again for Alan, and we pray your blessing on him. We pray that you will bless the uh, organization of this local church, pastor, the associate pastor, the deacons, the council that we have, the people who are here willing to serve, willing to work, Father, we pray that we might be faithful, that we might see people saved, that we might disciple them, we might fulfill the Great Commission, we might be a healthy, functioning local church. Father, bless now uh, our potluck, our time of fellowship, bless the food that we'll be partaking of, and we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are dismissed. Lord bless you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Amen. <laughs>